Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to do a quick, quick review of this combined science paper. I was extremely busy. As a matter of fact, I'm just waking up to do this. I want to do this to ensure that at least few of you can see this before the examination. And so, again, it's a BGCC pass paper. It is a combined science, as mentioned. It is a paper three, and it was from the year 2021. Again, please remember to always write a school number. Your candidate number is also important. Your surname and the initials. They are also extremely important. Again, please read through all instructions carefully before you go through the paper. All right, and if you have any problems, clarify them as well. Again, for the paper three, they will provide you with a graph paper. Um, usually, you have a graph to do on paper three, so prepare yourself to do a graph. Again, um, they will provide you with a periodic table, so please use it if necessary. All right, you can also use a calculator, but also remember to query anything that you do not understand before you begin the examination. All right, so let's jump into the action. And so question number one here, now you see the diagram shows a structure in the small intestines. And so I just quickly label the different parts that are shown here. All right, and so we have the capillary, we have the lacteal, we have the epithelium, we have the goblet cells, which are also called the mucous cells or mucous gland. All right, so you can just mention that. As a matter of fact, the goblet cells are not normally tested on this examination. All right, but since this there, I actually just label it. All right, so for part A of this question, it says state the exact location in small intestines where this structure can be found, and this structure is found on the walls of the small intestine. That's a specific location. All right, so on the walls of the small intestine. Now for part two, it says state the function of the, of the structure, and the structure is really to absorb digested nutrients. All right, so that's very important to make a note of that. Now for part B, one, it said identify the parts labeled P and T. And as on the diagram, we already look at those. So it will be, um, we have the capillaries. All right, so look at the network of capillaries inside. We have lacteal. We have the epithelium, which is the outer layer or outer cells. So there are epithelium cells. All right, so the entire structure is called epithelium. The each cell is called a epithelium cell. All right, and notice we have here, we have arch um, to vein, which is R, and then S is artery. All right. And of course, just to make a note that what brings substances from this structure towards the liver is called the hepatic portal vein, just to mention that. All right. And so we have epithelium and lacteal, respectively, in terms of those two structures, um, P and T. All right. And so the next part of this question is to explain two ways how the structure shown in the diagram is adapted to suit its function. And so it has a thin wall for absorption, moist as well. It has a large surface area and a lot of capillaries. And all of this, uh, they are associated with um, absorption or effective absorption of nutrients. A part three is to identify the group of digestive enzymes and end products of a named nutrient transported by U and T in the diagram above. And so for U, the nutrient in part U, which is the capillaries, um, there are generally two substances that are transported there, and we have proteins and we have carbohydrates. The digestive enzymes that break down proteins are called proteases, and those that break down carbohydrates are called carbohydrases. And so an example of proteases may be pepsin, all right, and also trypsin. For carbohydrates, you may have um, amylase, all right, you may also have um, maltase, sucrase, and so on. The end products. Of the protein digestion, we have amino acids. I should put actually acids. So amino acids should be here. All right, so I must quickly put that in. So it's amino acids. And then we have glucose for carbohydrates as the end product. Now for nutrient in, in part T, which is a lacteal, we have fats. The digestive enzyme that breaks down fat is actually lipase. The end products of the digestion of fats is fatty acids and glycerol. All right, let's go to question number two at this time. And the question asks to distinguish between an electrical conductor and an insulator. And so an electrical conductor or electrical conductors, they allow current to flow through them, while insulators oppose the flow of current. All right, and just to make a mention, another difference right here is that conductors are normally metals and insulators, they are normally non-metals. All right, so let's go to part B of this question. It's to define the current electricity and state the SI unit. So current electricity is the flow of electrons, actually flow of electrons or charges uh, through a conductor. And the SI unit 
for current electricity is SI unit. Oh, um, this a unit for current electricity is the ampere, which is symbolized by A, uppercase A. All right. All right. So going through quickly, for part C, you now we said that the diagram below shows a simple generator. When the coil is rotated, a current flows and lights the lamp. All right. And so if you notice, um, here you have a split ring. You have split um, slip rings. Sorry, not split ring, but slip rings. Um, you have also... Um, the magnets, which is north and south poles, and you have the coil that go around to come back in, and that's where the current will end up generated from these um, slip rings. All right, and just to quickly run through this, there are three ways of increasing the current in the coil, and so one is to have faster turning or rotation. You can also increase the magnetic field by having a stronger magnet. Uh, also, you can have um, slightly thicker wires to reduce resistance because the thinner the wires, you have more resistance, so less current will flow per time. But the wires cannot be too thick in, um, in making um, the generator, of course. Right? They must be relatively thin, but if you make them slightly thicker, then more current will be able to flow, which means less resistance. Again, um, you can also increase the number of turnings as well. So the number of turns, uh, more turns mean more current. Now, for part two of this section, he said, um, is the current produced AC or DC? And give a reason for your answer. And so, it is an AC generator because what they have here, you have slip rings. And since you have slip rings, it is AC. And just to make a note as well, right, is that if you have split rings, so notice two different things. You have slip for AC and you have split rings for um, DC generators. So that's the difference. And notice the notation here in red. So note that DC generators have slip rings, have split rings, or what they call a commutator. All right? So just to make mention of that. And so they'll actually look different. All right? So with, with, with split rings, it look like um, two half or uh, two, let's say two C-shaped, right? Uh, rings coming together side by side. All right? The slip rings, they are a little bit different, are separated. That's the big difference right there. All right, so explain the difference between AC, um, which is alternating current, and DC, which is, di which is direct current. And so for alternating current, the current constantly change direction. That's why they call alternating. It's alternating between a high and a low point. And while direct current now, the current only flows in one direction. All right? All right, next part of the question right here, as I'm saying, I'm going to go into this really, really quick to see if I could catch some of you before the examination. So for question number three, it said the label diagrams below show either the appearance of a normal red blood cell um, when they are placed in distilled water or concentrated um, salt solution. All right, and so if you notice the diagram carefully, you have A, B, and C. And so I could quickly just tell you what they are. Uh, A, you notice that the, cell is, the cells, they are really large, and actually one actually burst, which is called lice. And so here now, um, B, they look normal, so this is be the normal um, red blood cell. And in C, they get really, really small. They shrink. Uh, if you notice, they look like raisins. All right, so they really, really shrink. That means that one was placed in concentrated solution. So for part A, one is that identify the letters of the diagrams that show the red blood cells in distilled water and concentrated salt solution. And so distilled water is A because, again, the cells become, um, they become large, all right, and actually one lice, which is bursting. And concentrated salt solution will have to be um, C because they get really, really small or, or smaller, which means they became flaccid. All right, and again, the reason why they become large is because they have, um, water will go in the cells by osmosis. And in C, water will move from the cells by osmosis. A part of this part, is said that compare and explain the appearance of the red blood cells in distilled water and concentrated salt solution. So distilled water... The, uh, the cells, they swell or they become turgid, all right? Otherwise, the lysis take place, so they lyse, um, and so which means the cells uh, may burst. Uh, as you see, that one of the cells actually explode, looking like they're exploding, but actually bursting. Now, but concentrated salt solution, now the cells, they shrink, all right, which means they, beca they became flaccid, all right? All right, so part B of this question now, so describe what would, happen if onion cells were placed in distilled water for one hour. And so if the cells are placed in distilled water, what happens here? The cells will, 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 they will swell and become really turgid without bursting. Okay? 
So that's a big difference right there. And so for part two is to explain why this would, would be different from what happens in the red blood cell. And so again, because the onion is a plant cell, it has a, um, they have cell wall. And so what will happen now, the cell wall will prevent the cell from bursting. Animal cells such as red blood cells do not have cell wall. And so therefore they will burst if they're in distilled water. All right, so for part C, he said, um, water molecules, minerals, salts, and sugars move through plants. The diagram below shows the distribution of cells in the root of plants. And so here now, so with the help of arrows on the diagram, explain how water molecules enter the root here cell. And so if you notice, the arrows are showing you that water going in, all these um, arrows, and water will eventually travel that way and go up. All right, a matter of fact, water only travel in one direction in plants, water go up wards all right just remember that all right so here you now water enter the root here cell by osmosis that's very important for you to know and it moved from a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration through the membrane of the root here cell all right again water passes through the epidermal cells which are the first set of cells in the root after the root here cells i must make sure right here so this will be epitherm um, epidermal cells and then they move into what they call the cortex of the root and right here is the cortex of the root i'm pointing to right now and then it will move into the xylem vessel, and this is the xylem vessel right here. All right, so that's how water actually moves into the, the root here cell and then up into the plant. Matter of fact, the water will be pulled up in the plant as water evaporates from the, from the leaves. Water will, con will call or form what they call a continuous flow because of transpiration pull. And simply because why water can create a, uh, con uh, continuous flow is simply because what is uh, cohesive and adhesive and so they stick to each other stick to each other and also stick to the walls of the xylem all right and so pulling up one by evaporation the others will be con will continue pulling behind each other like a chain all right so question number four all right so it's a diagram here now below shows the global energy production from various sources and so if you look through the chart right here the pie chart is showing that oil is 32 percent gas is 24 coal is 30 percent nuclear is four percent hydro is seven percent and other will be three percent all right um part a is a given name of the three fossil fuels um, indicated by uh, indicated in diagram and so here we have oil gas and coal all right and so let's go into the next part it said that a type of fossil fuel is methane which is ch4 is a write a balance equation for the complete combustion of methane and so this is the equation right here plus just note this that um whenever you have combustion oxygen is needed so oxygen must be there all right and so the methane will react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and um, water and also energy so any combustion will, pro will produce carbon dioxide water and energy again once you do that you just the, the red the numbers in red which are the molecules or atoms um those were used to balance out the equation, all right? Because what is on the reactant side must equal to what on the product side, on the product side in terms of atoms. All right, so part three of this is to name one environmental problem caused by the burning of fossil fuels. And so here you have global warming, and some of the things that may cause from global warming may include extreme um, weathers, also rising um, sea levels as well. You may also have that, all right? And you also have acid rain, possible. You have air pollution, and air pollution can lead to respiratory problems. I right, just to make a note right there as well. Um, also, you may have ocean acidification, all right, and ocean acidification may also occur. You may have respiratory um, issues. All right, let me just put respiratory issues. You may also have that. All right, just to make mention of that. All right, and so you have other problems as well that you may have uh, sea level rising, as I mentioned. Flooding may take place. There are a number of different things that happen because of global warming. All right, so part B is from the diagram, give the name of a method of energy production that can be considered as other on the pie chart. And so these are some of the, the other examples that you may have. You may have solar, you may have wind, you may have geothermal, you may have biomass. And there's identify one renewable energy source in the diagram, and that one is hydro uh, energy that is shown there. Just say hydro because it could, you could say hydroelectricity or hydropower, all right? And now for part three, it's a, what is the total production of energy from non-renewable um, resource, right? And non-renewable will include, again, I'm um, just to go back to the chart real quick. 
which include the oil, gas, coal, and the nuclear. All right, those are considered as non-renewable. All right, so the non-renewable, we just add up all those, which will give us 32 plus 24 plus 30 plus 4 give us 90%. All right, so sort of suggest, which is part C, so suggest the name of an element that is used as a source of nuclear energy. And most of us will remember um, uranium. Uranium is a common one. All right, also you have plutonium, you have um, radium, and you have thorium. All right, but again, uranium is a common one that you should always remember. All right. Part two, which is the last part of this question, is to give one um, disadvantage of the production of nuclear energy. And so it can be expensive. It could release toxic waste. It could be dangerous or, or actually cause health issues, um, cancers and so on, and especially if you're exposed to them. And many other dif different things could happen there. Uh, it's not easily stored. That's, very, that's also important to note. Again, um, I'm going to stop here today because of time, and I really want some of you to catch this. So some of the other topics that you may want to consider is ecosystem cells, body systems, transpiration, acid-base reactions, rate of reactions, food production, especially using microorganisms, such as production of um, cheese, yogurt, and so on. All right. Also, you can look at food preservation as well. Waves, um, which is sound and light, work, energy, and power. Magnetism, and these are just some of the topics I'm saying you can look at. I, again, I'm very sorry that I can't go through section B um, due to time. I'm just, as I said, I just woke up to do this, and so I just really wanted to have this. And so, again, good luck and hope you do extremely well. I'll right, talk to you soon.